Hey, afternoon, everyone. Um, so I'm going to be doing a 2023 year in review, Threads of Nation, the State Dystopia talk. Um, so I think it's very important uh, in order to do kind of retrospective, so to kind of look back at what has happened and then what we can learn from that going forward. Um, for those of you that have seen my own review talks in the past, um, this one's going to be a little bit different, uh, kind of more looking at themes rather than kind of the major events of the past year. Uh, just a quick introduction, uh, my day job is um, uh, helping organizations go to cloud uh, securely. I'm a uh, part of the Hexcon and BSART uh, Cape Town organizing team. Um, and my research interests are really focused on cybersecurity topics that intersect with national security and foreign policy uh, issues. Things like encryption, content scanning, disinformation, and uh, nation state uh, activity specifically. Um, cyber operations and offensive uh, capabilities of nation state actors. Um, I blog about some of this on, uh, on my website, uh, criticalvoid.com, and you can find me on Twitter at Jared Nordea. So like I mentioned in this talk, I'm not going to focus on all of the events that happened this year, but I would like to focus on some of the concerning themes that I've seen over the past year. So for, uh, for one, we're going to start off with the Snowden anniversary. So it's been 10 years since the Snowden leaks. We'll then go into the EU laws that have been passed. Um, the Snowden doc documents will kind of be a nice uh, kind of pretext to that. And then we'll end off talking about uh, Chinese cyber operations. So 10 years ago, Edwin Snowden uh, leaked a whole bunch of documents uh, revealing the NSA's uh, surveillance programs. And this really started after the 9-11 attack. So after the 9-11 attacks, the US uh, was kind of shell-shocked at what happened, and they passed several pieces of legislation, including the Patriot Act amendments to the FISA, 7, uh, FISA program, which included uh, Section um, 215 and 702, which uh, broadened the um, foreign surveillance that the NSA did. And what the Snowden documents really showed us is what they were really doing, but also kind of the, the scale uh, that they were doing it at, at and why they felt it was kind of, um, kind of necessary, I guess. And all of these revelations really sparked a global debate about mass surveillance. So one of the things that uh, one of the things that we learned through the Snowden documents is X Key Score, which is the NSA's mass surveillance uh, program. So there's over 150 sites uh, around the world at the time, which can ingest over 125 gigabytes of data per second. And remember, that's metadata, right? That's not uh, necessarily content. And X Key Score, a subset of that is called Tempora, which is the UK's uh, mass surveillance uh, program, which does a full take. So they store everything for three days, and then they they uh, can kind of target that down to 30 days um, in some cases. And the amount of metadata uh, uh, recorded by this is quite significant. So um, Boundless Informant, which is like the program to kind of visualize all of the data that they are getting, um, you know, has 124 billion records over a 30-day period. Um, so that's uh, quite significant. And then we also, from the Snowden documents, learned where they were storing all of this data. So um, in 2014, this is the year after the Snowden leaks, the NSA opened its data center in Salt Lake City, Utah. It's at least eight exabytes, obviously the exact storage capacity is uh, classified. Um, it has 140,000 square meters. This photo is a little bit deceiving because um, it's much larger than any shopping mall or most shopping malls in South Africa. Um, and yeah, so it's, it's much bigger than what it appears in this photo. And it also is super dense. So the actual aisles, if you've ever been in a data center, like the aisles in this facility are much narrower than um, what you would typically find in a data center. They actually had a problem, the Army Corps of Engineers had an issue where they were actually having electrical arcing between the aisles because of the amount of uh, density that they had. If you are familiar with the Facebook uh, kind of server design, 
uh, you'll understand how the arcing is uh, possible. Which I first, when I first heard about it, I was like, I didn't really understand it. But one of the things that we also learned from the Snowden documents is that the NSA has IT problems, right? So when you collect that much amount of data, you're going to have monitoring issues, you're going to have hard drive failures, you're going to have all of these kinds of things. So it was kind of nice to see that in the uh, some of the reports. And along with that, uh, when they do uh, this mass surveillance, uh, they have a program called uh, Term Oil, which does deep packet inspection, and then Turbine, which does deep packet injection. And they combine those two programs together um, to do Oh, the slide is wrong. Uh, oh, so they combine those two, uh, problems, uh, two programs together to do targeted attacks against common encryption technologies such as VPNs. What they can also do when they combine those two things together, um, there's a program called Quantum Insert and QFire, which uh, basically creates race conditions on the internet. So you can go to a specific site, and the NSA can have an SSO site that will be closer to you, and they can literally race the packet to your computer. So we actually had, a, a, as part of the documents, also found out that there was actually a SSO site in South Africa actually very close to our stay, which is uh, always, it's always at the back of my mind. Um, on a large ISP's network, it's unclear whether that ISP was complicit with the activity or not, um, but I guess we'll never know. And one of the things that they also, um, uh, from the documents, we found out that they have various programs targeting each of the OSI layers, so they have programs that find vulnerabilities in each of these layers. And if there aren't vulnerabilities, they try and manufacture vulnerabilities. So they will actually intentionally introduce insecure software code into some places in order to exploit it in the future. Now, I do want to mention that this is the old NSA. The new NSA is like quite different. We'll get to that in a moment. Um, but this is what the programs uh, kind of detailed. What we also saw is supply chain interdiction. So if somebody ordered a network switch, they would intercept that and they would actually implant a hardware chip into the device and then they would uh, ship it along. And most people at the time, like supply chain attacks weren't really something that people cared about. So obviously people didn't actually really inspect this. Um, it's unclear how many devices were actually targeted with us, but um, uh, it's something to kind of think about. What we also found out was uh, the NSA's ANC catalog. So these are how these are like kind of hidden, like James Bond style kind of gadgets that they can use to kind of collect information. And um, this can also be a net, so uh, a network investigative technique as well. Um, so to create like a side channel uh, that they can exfiltrate data out of a network with. So in order to enable this broad uh, program, we also learned from the Snowden documents about the black budget, which in 2013 was $52.6 billion. And that actually increased to $60.9 billion in 2015. And one of the interesting things that happened was this is a very famous incident. So uh, Senator Wyden was in questioning the James Clapper, which is the General of National uh, Intelligence. And Senator Wyden asked him, you know, does the NSA collect any data on hundreds of millions of Americans? And he replied, no, sir. And then he asked a clarification question saying, it does not. And Clapper replied, not wittingly. This was before the leaks, right? And this is one of the things that actually convinced Snowden to actually go forward with the leaks. Because if you have senior officials in the intelligence community sitting in Congress under oath committing perjury, like, where's the accountability in what's going on here? After the Snowden leaks, uh, a, a report was commissioned by an independent body as well as the White House, and that report found that um, the NSA's programs have never stopped a single terrorist attack. And actually, when the NSA actually does go after terrorists, it's actually the exception to what they do rather than the norm. I think one of the most uh, shocking things for me, if we look at Sydney, for example, um, the Link Cafe attack that happened a couple years ago, the police were actually warned 18 times before the attack actually happened and they did nothing. So, you know, we can talk about mass surveillance and intelligence capabilities all day long, but until you have like proper law enforcement actions on those kinds of uh, tip-offs, like, you know, 
like let's try to do that first before we you know expand our intelligence programs. So the tech community also at the time created a letter which was signed um, uh, of asking the government to you know kind of reform surveillance. Nothing really came of this. And after the uh, Snowden documents, I actually published a paper back in 2015 where I made the argument that we in the security community should see the NSA as an adversarial threat to the internet because they. Um, have programs designed to weaken encryption and internet technology that we rely on, as well as the hoarding of zero-day exploits. So when it comes to encryption, they actually try to introduce a backdoor into RSA security dual ECBRG uh, algorithm. And then with the Vault 7 leaks, we knew that they were, um, so this is uh, kind of cyber weapons that were then leaked by um, another person. And one of those things was called uh, Eternal Blue, which is an SMB vulnerability, which was developed uh, by the NSA. This was then weaponized by the North Koreans in WannaCry, which obviously had a big impact um, a few years ago, as well as NotPetya, which is kind of the largest ransomware attack that, or the most um, economically damaging uh, ransomware attack that has occurred uh, to date. What also then happened in 2020 is the uh, US Ninth Circuit actually revealed that this mass surveillance program exposed by Edward Snowden was actually unlawful. And there have been several attempts to do um, Section 702 reform. Um, so what, the, what Section 702 does is it allows the collection of metadata of non-US citizens, as well as US citizens when um, a, cr a crime is suspected of a, like that, that that's foreign. However, what the FBI has been doing is they've been actually using the 702 program to actually spy on senators, and obviously this has made them very unhappy. But even with that in place, like the reform has never actually happened. So they just keep reauthorizing it every couple of years without any kind of meaningful reform. And one of the uh, suggestions to reformers is to increase the warrant requirements in order to do this collection. But Christopher Ray, the FBI director, said, well, if they actually were to do that, it would be a de facto ban because their requirements in order to get it wouldn't meet the legal standards. And you should just think about that carefully, right? So what they're saying is they don't have, under normal due process, enough legal uh, justification to do this um, collection. <laughs> um, and like I said, the um, NSA um, is quite different, right? So in 2013, they had a completely different structure. In 2016, uh, Michael Rogers, who was the uh, NSA director at the time, um, ordered a new uh, NSA structure to be put in place. Uh, to kind of address the uh, challenges of the 21st century. Um, what this meant is there were quite a, quite a bunch of reshufflings, new directorates, and they collapsed others. And one of the things that also happened was is the NSA's elite hacking team, Tailored Access Operations, or TAR, was renamed uh, Computer Network Operations. And what they also did is they uh, invested $500 million in a new integrated cyber center. And the goal was to work closer with the private sector in order to kind of tackle things like uh, ransomware um, as well. So after the colonial pipeline attacks, Paul Nakasone, who was the NSA director at the time, you know, kind of came out and said that, you know, historically, um, ransomware is a criminal thing, so the FBI should handle that. But because a lot of ransomware is actually now affecting critical infrastructure, now it becomes a national security issue, and that something needs to be done about that. And if you really read between the lines, what he's actually saying is the hand should be released and that uh, Cyber Command, which is part of the NSA, should be able to go tackle uh, this rans these ransomware groups. And this is actually what's now been happening, and this is one of the trends uh, that I would like like to kind of uh, go forward or kind of share with you. So over the past 10 years, uh, the tides have been shifting, right? So um, back in 2013, the FBI did you know, law enforcement with a little bit of intelligence. Um, today, they do law enforcement and a lot of intelligence as well. Um, the NSA in 2013 pretty much only did intelligence. And now they're kind of going into that law enforcement um, kind of realm, which is also a little bit 
uh, problematic because there are problems if you don't have the proper administration of these agencies. But there's also some good things. So um, earlier this year, uh, the NSA Cyber Command and the FBI took out the Hive ransomware uh, group. So what actually happened was is the Department of Justice offered a $10 million reward for any information on the Hive ransomware group, which is a, a Russian-based um, a group. And what actually happened is uh, Russia actually blocked the FBI and the CIA's websites and the, their TIP websites um, after this came out, which I think was quite interesting. And then just kind of moving back to kind of the documents. So one of the documents that came out was this document showing at the time how um, the NSA was collecting information on Google. So um, at the time, the links between Google's data centers were not encrypted. So the NSA could actually see what was going on. And that smiley face, um, which I've uh, highlighted there, um, really pissed a lot of Google engineers off when they saw this. So there was a powder keg, ex like literally explosion at, at, at Google um, with people trying to, um, you know, kind of harden the infrastructure. And I think Google has done a lot of work with the state of encryption that we have today. So one of the things that they did was, is they announced in, back in 2014, you know, that HTTPS would become a ranking signal. And the year after that, uh, Let's Encrypt launched, uh, which offers, you know, free certificates in an automated way. Uh, with the automated request process. And as a result of that, both uh, pages loaded over HTTPS in Chrome has uh, you know, increased since the launch of Let's Encrypt. Um, and this has just you know, been climbing steadily. We're almost you know, in the high 90% of internet traffic is actually encrypted today. If we look at the CA market share, um, you know, Let's Encrypt has about 73% of the CA market share, and the number of certificates has also grown exponentially. So in my previous talks, uh, you know, in 2019, it was a big achievement to go past a billion certificates. There was a little bit of regression during COVID, and then in 2013, uh, sorry, this year, uh, you know, we have 5.9 billion certificates. I believe most of those are Kubernetes and container uh, certificates that people, you know, issue and then kill. It's not like actively used. I mean, they are active certificates. They are valid certificates, but they're not actually being served. And then also um, the use of elliptic curve uh, cryptography, um, you know, is kind of hovering around 16% um, as well, something that I like to kind of track. So... The next thing I want to talk about is dangerous EU laws, right? So we've spoken about how the Snowden leaks have kind of impacted the use of encryption and adoption of encryption around the world. Um, and one of the things that has kind of happened is that a lot of law enforcement agencies are going dark. So, in, And they have requested constantly that these tech companies actually introduce backdoors into encryption standards so that they have a lawful process in order to actually intercept this. Obviously, in the security community, we know that you can't really have a, a secure backdoor. Any backdoor will be abused eventually. And so... Instead, what the EU has done is they've actually started going after other regulation, um, which is kind of adjacent to encryption or kind of gets around the encryption issue. So one of those things is uh, the electronic identification and trust services, or basically identity as a service in the EU. So what the EU wants to do is they want to create a service, kind of like what Estonia has, where they want to be leaders in e-government, and because the EU is kind of a single market in some places, they want to be able to do cross-border identity verification, um, establishing trust for financial services, professional services, uh, tax filing, as well as government services. So there's a lot of benefits to having an electronic um, ID system. But one of the re problematic requirements is that um, the EU wants to force all OS and browser makers to install uh, or trust um, a EU certificates authority. However, this certificates authority will not be subject to the same regulations and requirements that other certificates authorities are uh, that have to uh, that they have to adhere to, right? So the CA browser forum um, controls all of the trust stores in all of the various browsers. So this is made up by all of the major uh, foundations, and they have a whole bunch of 
requirements in order to be added as to that trust store, right? So um, in some cases, certain browser manufacturers might change that trust store, but the, the browser forum really sets those standards. And one of those sta key standards is certificate transparency. So whenever a uh, certificate authority issues a new certificate, um, that will then actually be logged using this process. And without it, what can happen is um, the EU could go issue a certificate for somebody else and they could uh, man in the middle of that se session and you as the user would have no idea that this is actually happening. So in response to this, uh, open letter has been created by um, a whole bunch of scientists in the EU. Um, it has been signed by 504 scientists, so this includes researchers, PhDs, uh, professors of many of the leading universities in Europe, um, over 39 countries, and many non-government agencies as well. And um, yeah, we'll see what happens because if this, if this actually does become law, I think it's going to be very problematic uh, in the future. So one of the other things that also has kind of been going on the, the past while is uh, the Netherlands has introduced a new intelligence and security law, which is really an amendment to the uh, current law that they have. So what this will enable is it will give them a whole bunch of new capabilities to actually intercept uh, traffic. So over the past few years, it's gone through several revisions, um, but it hasn't actually been passed into law yet. Um, these new powers include data collection, interception, as well as uh, to hack back. And, they, and there's two components there. So the one is if they suspect somebody of a crime, uh, typically like a terrorist a related crime, um, they can actually hack into that person's device. They can deploy a net, a network investigative technique to be able to see what the person is doing. Um, however, the problem, yeah, is that there's a lack of due process, right? So um, they can deploy that, but there's no notification. So if they actually were to break into somebody's phone and that person happened to be innocent, uh, that person would never know, and I think that's like highly problematic. And then the second thing which I kind of agree with is um, this ability to shut down a C2 infrastructure. So if you have a botnet that has infected a whole bunch of systems, this law will allow the Dutch police to actually go break into those systems um, to patch them or to actually remove the uh, malware. Again, there are some problems with that, um, but you know, I think overall potentially a good thing. Um, What's interesting, though, is in 2018, they actually had a non-binding reform uh, referendum on the reform of the Intelligence and Services Act, and 49% actually voted against uh, any amendments um, which would... Uh, which would increase their powers, and 46% voted in favour uh, of the law. And one of the problems with the, this law is it's not actually a single law, it's actually three laws that reference each other, and what they try and do with the legal clauses and constraints is that they refer to each of these laws individually, and by doing so they create a lot of obfuscation. So even if you are really good with legal kind of documents, it's unclear what the actual scope and impact of these various laws are. And what happened last year was um, one of the intelligence officials actually resigned from the Netherlands in protest and uh, to blow the whistle on uh, this hacking law and to really show the lack of oversight that, 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 that this has. And you might ask, well, why should I care? Well, if you use a major tech uh, you know, tech site or platform. Um, most of the, our traffic passes through the a Amsterdam Internet Exchange. Many of our ISPs, I've highlighted two of them there. There are others um, that are peered in the, at the Amsterdam Internet Exchange. So, you know, this collection would actually affect your traffic as well. And then in the kind of final thing that I wanted to talk about is uh, China's espionage and cyber operations. Um, so China's end goal is to actually have strategic uh, dominance. So earlier this year, you might have heard of the you know massive spy balloon that flew over the US. Um, this photo is taken from a, a U-2 spy plane. It was eventually shot down by F-22 jet, which is actually the first air-to-air -air kill uh, of the F-22 uh, Raptor. And once 
it was actually recovered from the uh, water by the National Guard, um, and it was then uh, analysed. Both General Milley and the US Pentagon, you know, came out very clearly stating that this balloon didn't do any intelligence gathering. However, most people believe that it did, right? And I think this is part of the problem that we have with the uh, the media that we have. So much to the point that it's actually now a running joke. So in the military, they have the, these patches um, <laughs> that they will give out. And then it's also a gag at security conferences. So this is actually Cyber War Con. They had a, a balloon, and you might notice uh, there's a certain animal... Uh, <laughs> uh, Winnie the Pooh floating underneath uh, that balloon. So China has made it very clear that over the next, uh, you know, has publicly stated that it wants re reunification with Taiwan by 2049, and an invasion, if you go read the latest military reports, could happen as soon as uh, 2026. And um, if you, you know, the dates are like, oh, it could happen next year, but 2026 is really the most realistic date if they were to actually invade Taiwan. Um, you know, it's unclear... You know, none of us are fortune tellers, but if you go look at the posturing that China is doing, um, I think it's very likely that they're going to invade Taiwan. I mean, also based on the statements made by Xi Jinping. So, um, in a rec at this year, at the 74th anniversary of the founding of China, Xi Jinping said that the reuni reunification of China with Taiwan um, is the common aspiration, it's inevitable and will not be stopped by any force. And in order to achieve that, they have invested heavily into new weapon systems, missiles, aircraft. Um, it has expanded its army, air force uh, and various uh, intelligence capabilities as well as, as its navy uh, and submarines. China actually has the largest navy by the number of ships currently. However, the US has the largest uh, navy uh, when you go by tonnage. One of the things that they've also done is they've expanded a lot of their military bases and airports uh, to make them compatible with fighter jets. Um, so the, uh, the military air bases, they have created hardened... Um, uh, bunkers. They've also created ramps for fighter jets as well as extended runways uh, for cargo uh, or heavy airlift um, operations or missions. And what they've also been doing is they've been constantly flying into Taiwan's air defense identification zone with the number of aircraft going into the zone increasing steadily a year over year. And they also use this for propaganda. So they will, you know, fly into this, they see the reaction, and then this will actually be shared um, by China as, you know, progress as part of the reunification. And the U.S. has publicly come out and said, you know, that they will defend Taiwan if an invasion in, by China were to actually occur. And the U.S. has also sanctioned China from obtaining advanced semiconductors um, to build advanced AI, which could be used in uh, weapon systems. And to and what China has done in response to this is it has uh, stepped up economic espionage to kind of trade to steal trade secrets uh, for economic purposes. We'll talk about that in a moment. And then they've also stepped up their hunt forward operations to infiltrate US uh, critical infrastructure to be able to disrupt any kind of response by the US in, in the event that an invasion would actually occur. And what they have also done, and this goes back many, many years, when Xi Jinping came into power, he actually created a policy to encourage the investment into offensive capabilities by various universities. They've also created new laws to actually uh, create new um, kind of hackers effectively. And what they've also done in 2021 is they created a new law requ requiring Chinese security researchers to report vulnerabilities uh, to the government first and then only once the government has approved it, then they are allowed to uh, release it publicly. And then what China does in the background is they use those vulnerabilities as part of the cyber operations to actually go break into various companies. 
So this pipeline is quite uh, significant, right? So over the past year, um, there's been over a thousand researchers that have submitted close to 2,000 vulnerabilities. And of those 2,000 vulnerabilities, about 141 of those are critical severity, which is usually O-Day um, kind of vulnerabilities. And if we look at Chinese uh, cyber operations, so they have this vulnerability, manage, uh, vulnerability research program that then goes to a hotly desk. So as it gets... Uh, as it gets reported to the government, there is uh, then tasking for people to actually go find where they can exploit that vulnerability. They will then, uh, a scanning team will go look to find targets for that. Once they have infiltrated or identified vulnerable systems, that goes back to a hotly desk, and then um, three things will happen. So either that target will be um, selected for economic espionage. So if they, if it's a um, any kind of system that would have a lot of intellectual property, um, they'll actually go break into that uh, environment for economic development purposes. And they might also use the network as a forward forwarding point. So um, let's say you have a vulnerable border device, they'll actually break into that device and then use that as a pivot point to go attack some, someone else. And then they might also use it for signals intelligence um, purposes, which could include um, disrupting uh, any kind of um, at response by the US. So that's like forward posturing basically. And if we look at the attack life cycle, um, so after the initial compromise, they will establish a foothold, maintain presence, uh, move laterally, escalate their privileges, and then once that uh, once the mission is complete, um, obviously they might choose to stay. Uh, you know, so once they've stolen the data, they won't just necessarily leave. They might actually still maintain persistence so that they could use that network in the future. So I'm going to very quickly go through some of the examples. So um, when it comes to intellectual property theft, so American uh, Superconductor Corp was actually breached by the uh, or Chinese uh, state actors, and the company lost its competitive edge due to the theft of intellectual property, which was used by Sanoval, uh, which is a wind turbine um, company. And because they were able to undercut what uh, American Superconductor was able to do, they lost their competitive edge and as a result had to lay off 800 people as a result of this uh, breach. And then also recently there was reporting around the breach of NXP. So NXP is kind of a large semiconductor manufacturer. Um, I think one of the things that they're most not, uh, known for is uh, if you have YubiKeys or a lot of uh, kind of smart uh, card systems um, that's actually created by NXP and you can see uh, the potential problems uh, there. And there's also various um, chip designs which were stolen as part of this breach as well. Um, back in 2020, I uh, spoke about uh, the vaccine attacks, which also uh, tried to steal the ingredients and the kind of um, any intellectual property related to vaccine development as, uh, you know, for China to try to get ahead with that. Um, there have been uh, several investigations as well as charges laid by the um, FBI on uh, Chinese uh, MSS uh, hackers that have targeted various industries including high-tech manufacturing, medical devices, civil and industrial engineering, um, as well as many others. And then they, there's another group, APT41 or Chengdu 404 or APT41. Um, this is a company uh, that uh, publicly does pen testing, but secretly kind of behind closed doors, um, does uh, targeting uh, for the Chinese government. And they have participated in uh, several state-sponsored attacks, including the United States, France, Japan, Singapore, and South Korea. And if you've been following the news, they were actually quite active this year as well, across targeting in those countries that I mentioned. One of the... Uh, critical attacks that happened this year. Um, so Vol Typhoon, which is another Chinese state-based actor, they actually broke into um, US critical infrastructure in Guam, um, affecting uh, communications, manufacturing, utility, transportation, and maritime um, kind of industries. And the goal here is to do forward posturing, right? So what they wanted to do is break into the network so that in the 
to establish persistence so that in the event that China were to actually go invade Taiwan, they would then be able to use that access to be able to cause disruptions to the US response. And they are constantly doing this. So this is just one case where they were actually found um, you know, out. And one of the key things with this attack is the use of living off the land, which I'll talk about in a moment. Um, so in this specific incident, you know, a 14-net exploit was combined with the living off the land uh, to gain persistence. Um, and then also, um, once they had got gotten persistence, uh, that enabled Discovery uh, to go attack other things that they could get access to. So, um, as Dom mentioned earlier uh, in the keynote, uh, living off the land is becoming really, really uh, common for a lot of these attacks. So, this is when inbuilt system utilities uh, can run privileged commands for data access and persistence while evading detection, right? Because these are typically utilities that a lot of system administrators would use. And because these are inbuilt utilities, it is uh, difficult to actually detect this. So if we look at this example, which is specific to the uh, Typhoon attack. So in the first uh, screenshot, you see um, a command which is Base64 encoded. In the second one, you actually see the decoded one. So what that is doing is um, it's calling uh, lasses to uh, dump process memory. And then the last one is to actually then create installation media for a domain controller. And what China has also been doing is they have been acquiring land uh, and constructing buildings near US military bases for espionage purposes. They've also been using violence against Chinese dissidents to silence them, as well as launching campaigns to discredit any Chinese dissidents living abroad. And this is uh, concerning the five of countries quite significantly that this year they actually had a joint public briefing to actually warn the industry about all of these attacks. And this is like, very, very significant. So you had uh, the FBI with leaders of the various intel intelligence organizations of the various five us countries, so including ASIO from um, uh, Australia, MFR from the UK, and GSB, uh, which is from uh, Canada. And they have also issued you know, a warning that people need to be on the lookout for uh, these attacks. And then kind of in closing, you know, like I think we're in a, a bit of a tricky situation, right? So if we look at before 2020, a lot of vulnerabilities, specifically in security hardware, are being used by these attackers, not just Chinese actors, but other attackers to actually break into networks. And these are some of the you know critical ones that happened before 2020. If we look at what happened in 2020, um, eight of the 25 most exploited vulnerabilities were vulnerabilities in security gear. So the very gear that we purchased that we hope protects our network is now actually the entry point for these these um, attackers. And I think we are in a very sorry state when our security solutions are the actual thing that actually gets us breached. Um, specifically when it comes to kind of the smaller companies, um, they can't necessarily afford, you know, uh, a lot of uh, better solutions, I guess. Um, and then if we look at this year, you know, if we look at the most exploited vulnerabilities, um, you know, most of those things are border devices or border device related. And I think this is, you know, we have to come up with a solution of how we address this, right? So fixing this problem is a very complex one, but one that we need to get on at the bottom of so that we can start addressing this issue. And I think also companies should be held liable in some ways when they introduce these vulnerabilities. I know that might be a controversial thing to say, but if you do introduce like really bad bugs, like surely there should be some kind of repercussion as a result of that. Yeah, and with that, that is the end of my presentation. Thank you very much and happy to take any questions.